Those are your attendance. So if you'd like to come to the next meeting because you don't like the venue, and that would be fine. I requested the venue. comments and suggested okay well if it gets to the point where these people are getting out of hand yep. I think we just That's good. I, think you, I think you do close it down I mean exactly. you're gonna get the shit daddy anyway but but it, it, in a crowded room like this where people are agitated and it's small and it's hot that gets it gets risky I mean, you know that and I, but I've seen it so so let me know the TVs and stuff going? Okay. Okay. So it is working in the lobby. Okay. And uh, the audio is working out there too. How does it work? Folks, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm told that the TVs are working and so is the audio in the hallway. Um, and so, first of all, thank you for showing up tonight. Um, the intent of the meeting is uh, to hold a voluntary conversation um, between myself and the public. Um, I understand that there are some folks that are upset. I understand that there are some folks that are emotional. Um, my comment would be that as long as we can con maintain a civil dialogue, we'll keep talking. If, if folks are going to be emotional and we're going to have outbursts, then that's counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve tonight for both of us and and then we'll have to reschedule for a different time um, as Michael Lamar stated and I guess so that we're on the record um, this is a voluntary meeting that I asked to conduct and host at the city of Prescott the reason that I asked to have the meeting is to bring forward um, the project the proposal before it has actually occurred um, and listen to the public um, as we roll into what is designed with any annexation, especially a Prop 400 annexation, as a dialogue and a, uh, it's a fluid piece of business that kind of takes you where you go um, based on public comment and um, also the deal making that occurs on an annexation. Um, and so what I have tonight is a simple set of slides that gives us the chronological order of how we get here tonight. Um, I think it's important because there's misinformation in the public um, to, to set the record straight so there's a common base that we all start from as we move into the project. It's a question that will be asked later, so I'm going to address it now. When do you intend to apply for annexation? The annexation should be applied for officially, um, hopefully by next week. We're finalizing the legal descriptions to meet state statute and state code. Um, there are two processes that, that are necessary. One, there's state statute that governs an annexation that must be followed. The second process is Prop 400, which is a city of Prescott regulation. I might have gotten that wrong, but that, that's how I'm to conduct myself in the city of Prescott in a proposed annexation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start walking you through the slides and, and give you the chronological timeline. I am going to take questions um, and comments. What I'd like to do is work my way through my presentation first, um, and then we can bounce back and forth with the slides as they pertain to the questions. And um, we'll just talk and discuss it. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to ask people to, add, to let me know their names when they're addressing me. Um, you guys know my name, Jason Giese. I should know yours. Um, and without further ado, we'll, we'll get started. The first slide, and it's kind of awkward for me to be here blocking your view. Um, I don't know if maybe this mic works. 
Hello? Okay, this one works, that's a lot better. The first slide is, is of the ranch um, and how the ranch exists at the point that we took title um, in March of 2013. And so the, the previous owner of the ranch has not recorded a 36 acre subdivision or plat across all 15,000 acres. All of the legal work has been done in order to do so. Um, from, from uh, as it relates to the, to the history, um, this map is from approximately 2007. So that would be prior to the recession. Um, the significance of the map is that the 36 acre parcels are allowed by, by right under state law. So at, at what we haven't done since we've owned the ranch is recorded the 36 acre um, plat and or started any development of that nature. Um, and we've done that on purpose. Why? As it relates specifically to the land that we're talking about here tonight, we believe that it's highest and best use, the place it should reside in is Prescott, Arizona. Um, that, that is a question, meaning we're applying for annexation, we're asking to be annexed. It's not a right that we hold. It's not an entitlement. And so specifically, if I can get the pointer to work, kind of gets muted out. The lower part, we'll get into it. Maybe I'm just too far away. But the lower left part of the map shows the point of rocks. Um, the farm fields are then up to the north. Highway 89 is traversing the property east to west. And then it's easy to see the Prescott Airport and the land that we own on the east side of Granite Creek. In December of 2015, I put through a general plan amendment. Um, what was the purpose of amending the Prescott general plan? Uh, it was to set up the property for future annexation. And so this is the original map that was presented. It was voted on by the city council. It was passed unanimously in 2015. In October of last year, I brought forward this map. Um, and so the evolution is that we start to see lots on the map versus zoning designations so that the amendment to the general plan is consistent with what we're proposing as far as lotting and developing the property. Um, that what, I'm, what I'm doing is tying together a series of events that leads up to the annexation, in essence. So in this case, we obviously have the um, homestead annexation to the south, and you can see that it says storm. I have not been able to make a deal with the, the family members of Storm Ranch. We do not have a deal with them. Um, and in fact, I intend to apply for annexation without that storm piece as included in the annexation. Um, Thank you. The pointer doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> we'll do our best. Hey. So that that's plus or minus 90 acres of the Storm Ranch that um, in October of last year I intended to have under contract by this time. Uh, that did not work out. And so when we apply for annexation, I, I anticipate that that property will not be included. You can see that there's two nodes. It's kind of hard to lean into this thing. I'm going to try to get a little more comfortable. There's two nodes. There's a southern node here and the northern node up here. Um, I think that it's fairly safe to say that the reason that most of you are here has to do with the southern node and the point of rocks. Um, I'm happy to talk about all of the annexation, um, and, and maybe that is, that's something that's best left for the Q&A, and we'll just kind of see how it plays out. I can go back. It would be good if you mentioned to everybody what the benefits of utilizing annexed is. Sure. Why would I want to be, the, so the question is, why would we apply for annexation into the city of Prescott? Um, number one, we own a water right in Watson Lake. 
which is just off the map here, that we intend to sever and transfer to the city of Prescott's water portfolio. Um, it took me approximately two years to work with SRP through the process of validating that the water right on Granite Creek is the number one priority on Granite Creek and therefore supersedes SRP's water rights on the Verde. So a logical question would be, how did that happen? There was a man named John Duke. We're the successor in interest to John Duke. John Duke built the first dam that created what we now call Watson Lake. So Watson Lake, and my, my facts might not be perfect here, but Watson Lake is an approximately 5,600 acre foot impound. And our water right is 375 acre feet of that impound. On an annual basis, just so everybody understands, we take the water off of Watson Lake and we irrigate it the fields um, that are, are easy to see from Walden Farms or Center Point East. Um, and so that's what we do with the water on, the, on an annual basis. This is just a blow up, probably best to get into that in the Q&A. And again, a, 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 a blow up of the southern node. This doesn't show very well. We'll improve that prior to moving through the process. But this, this ends up showing lotting over the top of a Google Earth layer so that we can see topography and location. So probably, I don't have to guess much, but this is probably the slide that, that we want to talk about. So up to this point, what have we been doing is a, is a question that I would ask. Um, we've been meeting with various folks, whether that's city staff, business leaders, neighbors. I met with Joe Trudeau yesterday of the Center for Biological Diversity um, in order to discuss possible options for what might happen at the Point of Rocks. Um, the fundamental at play here is that the land was purchased. Um, the land was purchased primarily by a man named Stuart Swanson. Um, Stuart's an American who lives in London. I'm an owner with uh, Stuart and his brother Bart. And so the land was purchased in, uh, actually a note was purchased in approximately 2012. We were awarded title via federal bankruptcy court in 2013, I believe in March or April of 2013. So a large sum of money was paid for the asset. Um, I've had people ask me, well, why don't you donate the land? So the donation, <laughs> it gets difficult. It's a, prime, it's a primo piece of ground. I, I think that that's why everybody's sitting here, right? Uh, it has a significant monetary value. I, I don't know that some may agree with me, some may not, but in capitalistic society in the United States of America, it has a very large value. Um, why? Number one, the water right that goes with this piece of land creates an asset when packaged together that is not normal in our area. Um, you know, and the fact of the matter is that that package is something that I'm not here to speculate on the value, but it has a significant value. Is water better used on land to the north, land to the south? Just a rational question. Would you rather live closer to the primo land or further away from it? Um, that's, you know, in a very simplistic way, how values start to get derived and assigned to certain assets. We are not in a position to donate the land. We are in a position that is unique because the land is owned free and clear. We are more than happy to talk about trading for the land. Historically in the city of Prescott, open space has been purchased for cash. Um, we're in a unique position where we can, we look at cash, water, there's various things of value. We don't have to have cash. Um, frankly, everybody likes cash, but the reality of it is, is that what we're generally proposing is that a portion of the Pointer Rocks would be traded to the city of Prescott in exchange for water. Um, 
how large of a piece of property is that going to be? Well, if I sat here and said that I had any inkling tonight, I'd be lying to you. The whole reason for the annexation process is that it's a process. And as we move through that process, we will find relative value for assets like water and the point of rocks. Um, another proposal in our annexation is the end of the Prescott runway. That's an asset of value to the city of Prescott long term. Um, we are proposing to trade about 600 acres of land to the city of Prescott. What, what would we be trading for? Water, roads, bridges, water storage tanks, sewer lift stations. In, in my world, there's a whole menu of stuff that costs money. And so it's not, it might even be more simple if I was sitting here saying we require cash. But that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is it's, there's generally a, a teeter-totter as it relates to any negotiation. We're looking for fair value received for the assets that we give. Um, it's a rational position, and it's, it's a position that, that you know, we're, we're frankly quite lucky to be in. The other piece of this is we have the ability to master plan a very large piece of, of property. Normally in my career, uh, in the past, I've lived here for 22 years, uh, Jason owns a, a piece of land next to Nancy, who owns a piece of land next to Joe. And development happens incrementally as demand for the property occurs. In this case, we can look at a master plan for a very large area, take into consideration open space, trails, the potential for a city park, um, future growth opportunity for up at the airport, an area that drives jobs, base jobs in this area. Um, so we can look at it on a much more holistic and complete basis than, than normally economic conditions just allow development to occur. So moving forward, as we annex, we, we make our submittal. There will be multiple public meetings. Um, I, I can guarantee you there's at least five of them. And if there's, it won't be probably anywhere near five meetings, but there'll be another open house. There'll probably be two is my guess. There'll be two readings at planning and zoning at a minimum. There'll be two readings at, at city council. How long does this process take? I annexed the Dell subdivision next door to this land. It took me two, took me almost three years to accomplish that annexation. Um, it was contentious. There were people upset about the trails. There were people upset about the open space. There were people upset about the water. Um, the point that I'm making is this doesn't happen next week. This happens because there's a conversation that occurs in the public in a transparent way, and folks have the opportunity to weigh in and share their opinions, just like you've chosen to do tonight, which frankly I appreciate. It actually helps me, because at the end of the day, there might be good ideas in this room that affect the, the final configuration of the property if the city of Prescott votes to annex it. And that's always an if. There's no guarantee here. We spend a bunch of time, we spend a bunch of money, we put out a bunch of effort, and we roll the dice in essence. And so this is the, the first night where we start the process and, and we start to move forward. Yes, ma'am. So uh, there, there's two potential plan Bs, Penny, and thank you for remembering to let me know your name. Um, the first, the easiest thing, I'm gonna speak plainly. The easiest thing is for us to revert back to a 36 acre subdivision where I need no approvals from anybody because state law allows that activity and, and we go sell it. So that people understand because I've been told that some people say that, that you know they're just bluffing and they won't do that. I think most people would know where Coyote Springs is at in the room. Coyote Springs, a 36 acre parcel, is bringing $450,000 today. So I, I don't know what a 36 acre parcel close to town is worth, but I know it's a lot more than $450,000. That's one option, Penny. Second option would be the possibility of looking at annexing into the town of Prescott Valley instead of the city of Prescott. So 
those are the two options. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to address a couple points there before I come back to you, sir. So the Deepwell Ranch is the annexation that you're referring to. If I could, if, if I could speak, please. Set the record straight. The Deepwell Ranch was a result of a settlement of litigation. It's a 1967 agreement between the city of Prescott, the landowner, had to do with bringing the water line into Prescott for the water that we all use every day. As it relates to the Wilkinson family and, and us somehow taking the property from them, the Wilkinson family sold the property for approximately $132 million. The person who bought the property, there was a seller carry back, defaulted, quit making payments. We ended up buying the note from the Wilkinson family. So we didn't take the land from the Wilkinson family. And as it relates to jobs, this is a retirement area. There's no doubt about that. And I, and I think it's safe to say that the retirees had jobs. They're in a good, good place, they have money, and that, that's great, that's positive for our community. But as it relates to a, a father who's raising four children in this town and would love to see maybe one or two be able to live here someday, I don't, I, I, 
have a hard time seeing where jobs are a bad thing in this community or any other community in this country or in this world. Sir, you had your hand up. Thank you, Dean. Good question. Why do we have to do it or why would we do it? The, the, the reason that a developer has to prove up a hundred year water supply is because that's Arizona state law. So how do we do that? There's a, there's a, this is a, this is a big question and there's a lot of different answers as it relates to this property being annexed into the city of Prescott. City of Prescott's a designated water provider, okay? So if we take our water, which is our asset, transferred into their portfolio, legally they can serve us back water th via a water service agreement. In addition to that, we've been, we have already purchased a significant amount of extinguishment credit water um, that, that we owned. The purpose of that water, all of it, would be for development and to prove up the 100-year water supply as required by Arizona Department of Water Resources. So there's state law that we have to follow in that process. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, no. We, we haven't done that because we're not at the stage. Um, if, if we're not annexed into the city of Prescott, then we would look for other ways to service the property with water, not via the city of Prescott. Yes, sir. And what we do in order to understand the past is we replicate the past, and we use natural resources to do so. When I see all this development coming in, not only the Dells, but all around, it's a serious concern, not only for water, but for land as well, and land rights. Um, my first question is, where's the water coming from? And according to a U.S. government study, the average American, which a lot of people don't know, use 80 to 100 gallons of water a day. That's one person. So take a family of five, and you got 500 gallons. So we're in the desert. It's dry. Our water supply lowers. Where are we going to find it? You can't drink oil. You can't, you can't drink anything synthetic but water. So also the archaeology. I know for a fact, because I have worked in archaeology for a long time, the Dells has a tremendous amount of archaeology, dating all the way back to pre-agriculture. So one thing that I know about development is often when artifacts are found, they don't turn them in, and they don't follow the, the proper code to get the land surveyed and then eventually excavated. So that's another concern of mine, and I wonder how you're gonna deal with that and how your crew is gonna deal with that. And the second thing, or the third thing is, um, what I'm asking the city council is to hold off on development, not just in the Dells, but all around us, until we find out a good solid plan and then we can go from there. Because developing at this rapid pace, mass developing, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for the ecosystem. It's not sustainable for water rights. And it's not, and it's not sustainable for archaeology. Once archaeology is gone, it is gone forever. It does not come back. Same thing with the land. When the land is gone, you can't bring it back. When development comes in, you can't bring it back. So ask yourself, everybody here, do we want Prescott to look like the city of Phoenix? Or do we want it to no. be wild? Because tourists come here to experience the outdoors and archaeology. They do not come here to experience another Phoenix. So.
So as it relates to the archaeology, um, we are required by Prop 400 to do an archaeological survey of the property. Um, if there are any areas, uh, burial sites, former um, ruins, there's two options. One, you can preserve it, meaning leave it alone. Two, you can remediate it. It's a lengthy process, it's a federal process, it's a costly process. Um, as I sit here today, we have not done the archaeological survey yet. That'll be part of the Prop 400 process. And as we identify sites, because there will be sites, there are sites all over Arizona, very active, um, we have a decision to make. I can tell you that where I lean hard is leave it alone. Um, and so there's examples of that at Prescott Lakes and other, area, other subdivisions around the area where um, significant finds have been set aside and, and preserved for open space. Um, water. You know, if, if you're west of the Mississippi River, there's a big conversation about water going on in your life. Um, something that will be a continual conversation. I'm not going to sit here and, and, and inflame uh, the crowd, um, but my opinions and my research on water would probably differ than, than most. Um, and part of that is the practical experience of drilling a well um, legally in the AMA um, that produces a significant amount of water. And so water is something to be conserved. And so in my business, in my opinion, um, you know, you look at water sense, water smart type uh, requirements or guidelines. And the next step of that is for us to use deed restrictions, a private tool, not a public tool, not required by the city of Prescott to enhance those restrictions. We're looking at um, recycling and harvesting presently, and we'll continue to do that. Um, my job is to be a good steward of the land um, and preserve and conserve and stretch water assets as far as we can. So as far as the archaeology aspect, because like I said, that's a real big concern of mine. Mm -hmm. How do you know that your crew that you hire is going to respect these artifacts? Because like I said, once they're gone, they're gone. History is lost. One single piece of pottery can tell us everything about that culture that used to live in. What trade routes were there? Where the trade routes were there? And it's not just on the surface, it's deep in the ground. So when you develop, you might not see things five feet down, you might see them much lower. Sure. So, like I said, my, my question is, what is the crew gonna do? We, we hire a, I don't even know if the term is right, a certified archeologist. I don't, I don't get to go do it, I can tell you that. Um, we hire someone who's certified in that field to perform a study across all of the land and they create an inventory, which you would be more familiar with than I am. Um, and as it relates to the artifacts, um, they're preserved if they're major. If we're digging a sewer line someday and we come across a, a skeleton, the job stops. There, there's, there's rules and regulations and laws that surround all of this as it pertains to our activities. and the Senate, and it's getting ready to get signed by Governor Ducey, that opens up archaeology to non-professionals. That means anybody can be an archaeologist. Anybody can dig, and that is seriously concerning with these developments. And I'll let you get back to it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. back over here to the leaner. Um, so I'm going to hit you with an answer on both slides. So the Y, Iron King Trail, Peavine Trail. Okay, so that's right in the middle of our property. Um, and is it true, I, I might be wrong, did I hear that you're planning to build a hotel on there? I'm going to click back to a slide real quick. In 
unfortunately the resolution isn't great, but the answer to your question, ma'am, is that this area right here was proposed as a hotel in December of 2015. Okay, hold on one second. So, so I'm being asked about the Y again and its, its location. The Y is here. The hotel location is there, north of the Y. One at a time. I'll answer them all. Yes, sir. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'm going to go, Doug, I'm assuming you're talking south of Heidi, Highway 89A on the grasslands question. Got it. Yep. Got it. Got it. So generally speaking, in this location here, we have, there is a drainage coming through here that, uh, that basically comes off of Glassford Hill. Above that drainage, let's say right here in this span of open space, this is the grassland area, okay? And then this would be the rock area. Make sense to you? I've called it Boulder Creek in the past and I've been corrected, so I honestly don't know the exact name of it. But I referred to it as Boulder Creek, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Linda Myron. Can you address the issue that I've heard a lot about radon, the concerns of drilling into granite and radon being released? So, uh, radon. We had a big article in the Courier about radon probably, what, six months ago, maybe. Um, radon's all over the country. Radon's all over Prescott, Arizona. Whenever you're in a granite formation, the radon can seep up from underneath. Um, when you look at the modern code book for the construction of a home, the ventilation that's required, it's not a, it's not a concern. Um, my answer to the reporter at the time when I was asked, when I was interviewed for that article, is that radon will be disclosed because it's the proper thing to do in our public report. So if you're a potential buyer of a lot, every lot, even if it's not next to the, in the subdivision, even if it's not in the granite, so to speak, would have a disclosure that would say there may be presence of radon gas. So you have a radon mitigation system in every home? Um, if, if, if it's a modern home, the reality of it is, is the code has been developed anticipating the possibility of radon. And so in our country, just like our law is built, incidents happen, new codes, new laws, new procedures get added. And so a modern home has a ventilation that would, would um, properly ventilate and allow the gas to escape instead of build up in the structure. Now there are certainly going to be people that say, I'm not going to risk it. I'm not interested. There might be radon here. That's absolutely their right. Um, but whether we're talking Hacienda, there's areas in Williamson Valley, uh, Granite Gardens next door. That there's radon in those rocks, and people make their own decision. Yes, sir. I'll come back to you. I'm going to switch mics. Oh, yeah. Can we have them connect to that mic for your questions so people can talk? Oh, sure. Yeah, I can do it. Well, I'll repeat it first. 
So we're, we're going to have folks come up to this mic to ask their question so that the folks in the hallway can hear it. So I'm, I'm going to repeat the, the question that I was asked, which is, how many roads are generally proposed and where are they crossing the trail at? And so the answer to the question is, you're going to have to be a little creative, but you'll get it. This road links into the Dell subdivision, and it's coming from the Fippin roundabout on Highway 89 that's presently under construction. So this, this road would be proposed um, to go underneath the trail in the present location where the old Highway 89A cut underneath the Peavine Trail. It's got chain link on it, on the bridge. Everybody's generally familiar with that location. There's a road that would cut across into this, uh, to the east underneath um, uh, I'm going to try to explain it exactly, but there's basically a giant cinder mound where the old railroad tracks were laid that's probably 40 feet tall. So the, the proposal would be to, again, go underneath the trail to eliminate any conflict with trail users. Um, so both of those crossings are actually underpasses, I guess would be the best way to describe them. There is an at-grade crossing that exists today. This is the driveway, generally, into the Storm Ranch that we share with our neighbor. And so everybody, I think, is probably pretty familiar. Lots of folks like to use it as a shortcut to get on the trail. Um, they're actually trespassing, but we don't send the sheriff or the cops out there to ticket anybody. Um, so that, that is an at-grade trail crossing of the Peavine that exists presently that we would straighten out and reutilize. The last trail crossing, this is a bad picture for it. And this one is, is very difficult, is on the Iron King over in this area. That would be proposed at grade because of the way that the topography and the land lays presently. So the sum total of the proposal is four crossings, two underpasses, one reutilization of the existing crossing at grade, one new crossing on the Iron King Trail at grade. Yeah, it's going to get a little inconvenient because we don't have a mic to be able to walk around. So why can I ask without a microphone? Okay. You're talking about all these roads crossing. Yesterday I took my kayak down to Clapton Rock. It was gorgeous. And there were duck wings that were on the bottom of the shore. And there were duck What exactly do you think the draw that will be when you have cars going back and forth to the people that you're trying to sell houses to who no longer will have the kind of beauty that you are trying to pre present to them as a reason to move there. My name is Joyce. Joyce, thank you. Um, j just so I know where you were at, not that I'm stalking you, but y you were on your kayak on Watson Lake? Yeah, on Watson Lake. Okay. So, so, I mean, the reality of it is you, you drove your car. You didn't pack your kayak over to Watson Lake, didn't you? How did you get... So, so what, what I'm asking what that's about, not about how I got there. Well, well the, the fundamental reality is that in America, we tend to drive our vehicles everywhere. I ride a bicycle as well. Okay, so do I. So uh, the, the, what answer would you like? There will be more traffic. Yep. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Are you not going to comment on that? My comment is there will be more traffic as people move into the area. And okay, it won't so be just in this location. So let me continue her question then. Exactly what do you estimate the traffic are? Because you have lots set out at, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, half acre, three quarters of an acre, two acre, three acre, and five acre that used to be 30 and 50 acre places. And although there are some mountain bikes and hikers that do cross the storm road right now, it's people who are there for recreational use only or visitors to the storm ranch. Now. What exactly do you expect this 
this incurs of you know residents to be and how many cars coming and going a day there will be a traffic study performed that is required as part of the annexation mm -hmm. to answer that question exactly and what is your guesstimate now is what i'm asking i have no idea i'm not a traffic how many engineer. houses have you got slated in there now how many lots where specifically This area here, where you're going to put the second crossing or the first land crossing. This map and this map would be two, sorry, different answers. Part. So the lower part 198 units plus a resort. One, uh, 198. So you have at least two people per house, mostly retirees. 2.1, 2.2. Mm -hmm. Okay, 2.2. So that's at least 400 cars going at least once a day out and back. That will. And how, exa and how wide will this road be? How we have to lanes? build the, ride, the roads to city standards based on the results of the traffic survey. So you're going to, that means that you'll need, if you've got 400 coming out, if far am I correct, maybe, I don't know the. the um, roads person isn't here, but that would probably be at least three lanes. It, it's lane, about it's about and, and 20 ingress, trips ingress. per hour on a 24-hour clock. That's actually more. That's actually a lot more than 20 trips plus per hour. the resort. Plus the resort. Okay, so that finishes with her question. Um, you've promised in the website that you're going to have 25%, I believe it is, mm -hmm. of the land available for public access. Now, looking at one of the maps you showed. Public access is open space. Open space, right. I make that clear. Okay. So you said that 25% will be open space, public access. But when I was looking at the lots and seeing where the, you know, looking at that on top of a topo map, looking at it, it looks like all the part that looks like this, that, you know, you'd have to climb up with a rope and rappel down, sorry, so that you'd have to climb up with a rope and rappel down is the stuff that you're leaving for the public access that doesn't make it very accessible for anybody that's not a rock climber from Prescott College. So, so what? We depend, so you would, in this city, you would like, we depend on our tourism. What, so what you're asking me for, presently the land is private. If right. someone's using our flat land, they're trespassing. Mm -hmm. Right, but I'm, what I'm talking about is what you're saying in your website and what you promised the city is 25% of the land would be open space land that is accessible for the public for community use, quote, unquote. So, and yet what so, you're leaving in the plans, as is now, is not accessible because people don't have pitons and crampons and ropes and et cetera, et cetera. Well, well there's certainly people in this community that use those rocks on a daily there basis. There are, and that's about 1% of the community. That's so nice of you to lend, lend, you know, lend that land so, 1%. So the promise that you're talking about is, is actually the land development code. The land development code requires a developer under a planned area development to have a minimum of 25% open space. Presently, that number is more 35% on our mapping. 31. Okay, whatever. <laughs> when we get done with the studies, mm -hmm. that'll grow. That's what always happens. We haven't performed the studies. What are the studies? Archaeological, traffic studies, um, drainage studies, there's multiple layers that, that get created in order to, to develop a piece of property. So the open space that's required is not required to be open or utilized by the city of Prescott residents. So, so this community you talk about in your website and you talk to the city about is not actually this community. It's like maybe somewhere over in Tanzania. So... The, I mean, that's I'm what you're setting, saying to me. What, what I'm telling you is there are rules and regulations that I am required to follow, and they will be followed. We will end up in excess. We will exceed those requirements. But then you're telling me at the end of that last sentence 
that it's not There necessary. is no requirement for me to provide open space so that anybody, not a resident of the subdivision, can use it as they see fit. So part of the challenge that we've had in the past is that our property is utilized on a daily basis by folks that don't have the right to be there. So it's your no website says that we're providing 25% of this for community use for the greater community of Prescott and surrounds. Now you're telling me that these people are, press, are trespassing and that you don't have to provide any of it at all. I'm telling you as it exists today. So do those not conflict, those two statements not conflict Maybe with they each do other? today and maybe they don't tomorrow. If we trade away the city of the, the, the point of rocks to the city of Prescott, the city of Prescott would own that land, not us. It would be a different type of open space, not privately owned, publicly owned, and that open space would be eligible for utilization by the public. During this process, we will certainly determine how much of each flavor, if you will, of open space there will be on the map because I know that there's going to be both. Well, I'm sure the birds will enjoy sitting on top of the rocks. My name is Happy Oasis. I live in the Granite Dells, less than a quarter of a mile away from the proposed project. And I'm going to speak for a minute or two if I can, Jason. I was hiking the other day on the wonderful new trails that were built by the Over the Hill Gang, east of the Watson Lake, right? Incredible trails. They did a great job, again. And I was out there, and I came in touch with about seven antelope. Amazing. As I was leaving that circle, a group of four rowdy hikers, exuberant, were coming right toward the antelope. My heart sank. There's too many people on the trails. I appreciate her opinion. And being a resident of the Granite Dells, I have another opinion, and that is, I don't want a regional park full of people because there's so much fragility right now with the flora and the fauna that I would rather have it, no, I would not rather have houses, no. I would rather leave the wildlife alone as much as possible so I don't want a parking lot on Granite Dells Road filled with hundreds of people climbing all over the rocks and hiking more than they already are. When I moved here almost 30 years ago, the railroad track, you might have known, was a railroad. And then it was, there was nothing on it. There was nobody on it. And almost nobody for the last, until the last five years, it suddenly became way too popular for our taste. The, uh, those of us who live in the Dells feel that there's way too many people out there already. Having a development is not a solution, definitely. But also having a regional park, in addition to a development, just think of what we're proposing, a regional park with the development means we've got people coming in from the north. If he does get this passed, I, I personally hope it is not passed, but if he does, then you're gonna have 3,000 plus people coming into the Dells from the north, plus a regional park. Imagine that at Point of Rocks. So I don't know what the solution is, but that's one of my concerns. Secondly, because I've lived here a long time, who remembers when Highway 89 was through the north there? It was a two-lane road, yeah. so that's already there. I'm not saying it would be great to have a road there, but it's already there. It's fallen apart, but my three other concerns, which are more, more concerning me, one is this proposed resort. Instead of having a road on what you call Boulder Creek, but actually you probably haven't hiked around Watson Lake, that's where the real Boulder Creek is. It's named Boulder Creek. But you are, let's call it Boulder Creek to the north. Is there any way, if you got this passed, that your development could go through the Dells and leave that wildlife corridor, leave that beautiful, I, know, I understand that you're thinking, well, we won't pass over the railroad if we build under it. But when you look down there, it's absolutely magical. And it really is pristine. 
and if there's any way that development could have a road coming from the north, do you have access through the Dallas, Dallas subdivision? Do you have permission or not? We have legal access through the Dell subdivision over the top. Because imagine this, if you had your, I hope it doesn't pass, but if it did, if you had your Dells with a view looking in from the resort on top, or your luxury homes on top, I wouldn't want that, but is a compromise, you, you would be very, how do I say, very expensive for people to buy that. And then this other, I'm concerned about the Granite Dells Road because I live right off of Granite Dells Road. Are you proposing that you would have a gated community with a gate and then you'd have two acre parcels with mansions there or what are you proposing? We are not proposing to use Granite Dells Road as a primary access point. We would be proposing that it is gated and it would be used for a secondary access point for emergency vehicular access only. So it wouldn't be a gated community with people driving in and out with a gatekeeper or something? From the north, it would be gated, but the, the primary access would not be via Granite Dells Road. And then the north is the fourth road. So the north, you're saying it would come down over the Iron King. Is that what you're saying? Is there any way you could avoid from the, the From the north is right here. Oh, right on the edge. So what about this road that you propose in the east? Over here? Yes. What is that? That's near the Iron King. Yep, that would be behind the gate right there. Oh, so that's, is there any way that could be avoided and it could just go through the north? Oh, yeah. Anyway, something to think about. Thank you. And one last question. Um, I'm just looking at what it's going to look like. Thank you. Um, last night I rode my bicycle from the Granite Dells where I live through on the Peavine along the Iron King and I went out to see the Jasper subdivision and I was kind of surprised because you know it's the eco development and there wasn't one shrub left one for one herb one blade of grass and I was thinking Jason I say Jason because we've met before I thought gosh you can do better than that so I'm just wondering I know a lot of people in Prescott Valley have had regrets because right now it looks like a mess. Now it might look better, but it's going to be full of houses. But it looks just devastating right now. And is that the kind of eco, you know, ecology, which there's nothing left of it, the eco development that you're planning to do here, like wipe out everything? Or what, what were you thinking? So, Happy, what, what you're referring to is a mass grade. It's a mass grade. Jasper is a mass graded subdivision. And so it's in the middle of construction. It's not going to look like it looks today when it's complete. So at the point that the landscaping and everything goes back, the hydro seed, um, it, it will have a completely different character. It is dense. There are a lot of houses there. There's no doubt about that. But wait until we finish, which will be about a year from now, and then the finished product will be on display because you're looking at it at its worst. There's no doubt about that as it relates to this piece of property. Where are we proposing to mass grade? Up in the flatland, the former farm area. This is a mass graded subdivision right here. So the mass grading would be up in this area. We are not proposing to mass grade in this area. Yes, sir, you've been waiting patiently. I'm David Humphrey. I live about 400 yards that way, downtown Prescott. And uh, I've lived here for 40 some years. And somebody told me today when I told them where I was coming, and they said, all this is is a, a, a way to keep people feeling like they have a voice. And you really don't have a voice until it becomes a legal voice. Now, I'm a member of Nature Conservatory and Conservancy, and they are interested in this, and they have lawyers working on it. And, you're, and they don't just want to know about your project. They want to know, what about the city that said it's okay? Yes. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of bad people here. Now, you seem like a very nice man. You're polite, but there's a lot of people that okayed this to take something away that's dear to us, and 
and just say, okay, come on out. Tell us all about why you're upset. Well, we're upset because we're getting screwed. One last question. Would it be possible to make the dollar amount that you want to make by keeping everything out of the Dells and leaving the area that's really sacred to everybody here alone and just having your resort and having everything to the north of your resort and just having a, maybe it's a different style of home or something that could still be economically feasible. And then as somebody had said, I don't know if it's donated to the city, but instead increase your open space so it's more like 60% or something like that. Well, I know the city council. <laughs> I'm going to go over this mic real quick. I got to hold on, man. Happy to ask a good question. Um, there's all kinds of different types of development, and there are possibilities that could increase open space in the area. Um, again, it's a process, it's a conversation, it ends up being a negotiation. Um, but it's, it's not a situation where we are, um, we're asking to be annexed, we're not demanding anything, we can't legally. And so as the process unfolds, there could be possibilities that can be explored I'm open to it, Stewart's open to it, to look at ways to minimize impact. I say that, and I want to be very, very clear. That, that's not a guarantee, that's not a promise. What, what it is, is a practical answer to a solution that's designed to get to a practical outcome. And so the possibilities are, can be considered, and, and they will be over the course of time, I'm sure of that. Yes, ma'am, you were waiting patiently. I'm, I'm Janet Miller, and um, so I think it goes without saying that most of us here you know, do feel that the area around the Point of Rocks is pristine for many reasons, both from a, you know ecological, wildlife, um, area as well as recreation possibilities. So I think I heard you say early on in your presentation that as part of the process, you may be, um, I mean, I know some people have asked you to donate land outright and you know there's significant monetary value to this land, but that it sounds like you may be open to trading the land for other assets and other assets you know, could be cash, could be water, could be infrastructure, uh, other land. So is that something that you are open to? And would your timeline support the process that it might take to trade you know, that, that very sensitive area for some other type of asset and, and the negotiations that could be involved in it? And knowing that it may take more resources than the city of Prescott has, or Yavapai County, um, potentially the state of Arizona. Um, so so I, I can't help it, but the state of Arizona has less money that they give the city of Prescott than Prescott has. I'm not trying to start a fight. Um, the answer to your question, the direct answer is yes, we're, we're businessmen, okay? We understand that and we're looking for a practical solution. That practical solution certainly has a monetary uh, agenda, goal, um, but there are always alternatives that can be explored. So that I'm absolutely on the record because I'm happy to be there. Time is always of the essence once we start the process. Historically, what we see, and I'm going to pick on Mark Worth's piece of property in the Dells. It's a very sensitive piece of property. The conversation has been going on for 10 to 15 years. Um, we won't wait around for 10 or 15 years. So if somebody has a great idea and they want to participate in the conversation, part of the reason that, in essence, I'm dropping the flag and starting the process is to flush them out of the bushes. If someone has a great idea, someone has a proposal, we're happy to listen. Okay, so I mean, and so I'm, you know, thinking specifically of what the process was involved to create Red Rock State Park, 
where that was there were a series of, of land exchanges and negotiated deals in order to make that property available to become a park and you know and it involved compensation to the property owners and the, and the parties involved in the deal so so not that I'm trying to eliminate options but federal land exchanges I am familiar with very tough to accomplish Congress gets to vote on them seven to ten years that's not a possibility for us we've met with the Nature Conservancy I met with the Center for Biological Diversity yesterday we have met with the Game and Fish Department um, there are separate pots of money out there and um, it's kind of a confusing answer but we're happy to look at possibilities that in include various types of compensation um, happy was referring to a, a density transfer in my world that's a form of compensation water is a, a form of compensation um, tax write-offs are a form of compensation so we're, we're open-minded but but my my uh, my history and development and, and watching this community, there was one time when action happened as it related to open space, and that was after the open space sales tax was passed. And there was vigorous buying activity that occurred at that time. And so, so that everybody understands, my concern is we're, we're not going to be here in a decade having the same conversation. So the time to act is now. It's my job to start that process. And someone has a great idea we're we're happy to hear it okay so i mean so there is some time just not un, you know certainly there, there's not. always time that, and and just to give you an idea uh the property won't be developed if if we're successful in the annexation i'm going to take i'm going to tell you it's going to take two years just to engineer the property so so that our development rights are something that that we that create value um and sometimes uh, resolutions bubble up because of action. They don't tend to bubble up when people are just talking in the coffee shop saying, did you hear what this guy had to say or what she said? Sure, sure, so, sure. That makes sense. So we're here on purpose, I guess, is the, the bottom line. We're starting the conversation. You got it. Okay. Yes, okay. ma'am. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I haven't heard from either of these two. I've heard a few times. Yeah, just real quick. Question for the, the town council. Town council's, town council's not here to talk tonight. Oh. There, there will be plenty of public meetings where they will be here, though. Okay, well, I'll propose it. Would the council consider buying him off? And No, I know. I'm, I'm just saying in general, would you guys consider it? And a way to, I mean, you guys love taxing us, so. <laughs> yeah. Same here. You know what? I would even be willing to spend five dollars to get into the Dells, and take that money and buy him off. No. Well, it's either that or a bunch of homes. Hi everyone. I'm Joe Trudeau, the chairman of the Save the Dells Pack. Um, <laughs> I want to. Um, I want to. I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank Jason for doing this because he's not required to do this, but he has heard the call in this community that the Dells are really important, and so um, I know uh, a lot of people are here tearing into him for this proposal. But um, let's let's be fair. Like he said, um, this is just the beginning of the process. All right. Now another thing, I, I want to thank city council members, former mayor, um, other people who are not on the record um, for being here. Uh, the four, we counted about 400 people. Um, it's a pretty darn good turnout for something like this. 450? All right, great. I stopped counting, I guess. Um, it's a really impressive turnout, and I think it should speak to the, uh, the depth of thought that the council really should engage on this project. And another example of, of why this requires such so much so much thought is let's let's consider um, Happy's point that she doesn't like the 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 regional park idea, all right? And then in contrast, is it Tana? Tana seemed to have kind of an opposite perspective. And then the gentleman who was just up, he says, "I'd pay five bucks to get in there." There's a lot of different ways to skin this cat. You know, we have a lot of thinking to do about this. This is the last chance. Prescott will have to ever pr 
protect this piece of property. Yeah. And so we don't get to have this conversation again. We've got the next six months to a year to think about this idea of there being too many people out there versus there being a bunch of houses versus there being a resort. And there, in the end, it's going to be a combination of a lot of different things, but it's important that we save the Granite Dells. In my opinion, in the opinion of, of the Save the Dells group, we save all of the Granite Dells, all right? And there, there, need, there needs to be a coordinated, cohesive, uh, systematic way of thinking about this planning effort because um, we don't want to really tick off people like Happy who live there and don't want to see 800 people coming through her yard every day getting lost on the way to the regional park. They already are. Well, and she's got a trail going right to her house too, so, um, but I won't tell you where it is. So, Thank you everyone for being here. This is just the beginning of the discussion. I hope that the city is really ready to listen to the people on this because um, this is a make or break moment for the city's character. We have an opportunity here to... <laughs> we, we have an opportunity to, to create a, a well thought out park that can accomplish biodiversity perspectives, uh, provide recreation, open space, provide opportunities for solitude. It doesn't have to be crisscrossed by trails. We don't have to give Chris Hosking all of the freedom in the world, you know, <laughs> um, even though that's great. But we can do something here that is, you know, light years ahead of what a lot of cities are doing. People are moving to Prescott for the Granite Dells. People are. I've talked to th a thousand regular folk in this position so far, people come up to me and say, I saw the Granite Dells in a magazine, so I moved to Prescott, you know, like this guy right there. And <laughs> let's nurture the possibility that we can create a healthy uh, outdoor recreation-based economy where people are getting outside and bringing their kids outside and being active and reducing our health care costs and reducing s stress on city services because these parks don't cost all that much to maintain. And uh, to Jason's, you know, Jason wants to be fairly compensated, you know? He's a businessman, they invested in the land. This is the time for us to work out these deals. Um, we've got a huge audience right now. Uh, if anybody knows the billionaire that wants to help us out and, and sit down with me and Jason and make something happen, you let me know, you know where to find me. All right. To be determined. <laughs> We're not talking about that yet because honestly, um, there's there's a lot of uh, there is a lot of trading and negotiation that happens between a developer and the planning and zoning in the city. Because you know, I, I I didn't see all of your presentation, but having talked to you and studied your materials, you know, like a, a developer within a planned area development. Is, is asking for a substantial investment from the city in order to facilitate his plan, which that's just how it works, right? Our position is in mean, Save the Dells, let's get a fair shake for the taxpayer, let's get a fair shake for people who love our community, and let's make this an equitable trade, you know? I want, I want Jason to succeed and get rich and buy a Rolls Royce and let me go for a ride in it. But I want him to do it in such a way that it doesn't compromise the Dells or the Peavine or the Iron King. And we can do that. We can really do that. Happy. Excellent. I hope that happens. That's a possible outcome. Yeah. <laughs> And see if you have any thoughts on that too, both of you, anyone. Um, I think there's one thing we totally all agree on besides what Jason just said, and that is water. Is that Steve Lamerson and, I mean, Jim Lamerson and Steve Blair have been on the water committee and they've been doing the best they can, but they sometimes f might feel in a place of regret. I'd like the city council to never feel regret again because I feel that development is one thing, 
but giving away our water should be non-negotiable. Do we all agree? So I think the, for the city council to represent the people of Prescott, that water, giving away water in a desert during a drought, scientists have all predicted that it's going to get worse and worse, that it is insane. And I hope that the city council will not agree to negotiating land for water. Money is one thing, but water is not negotiable. Okay. I'm, uh, there's a couple people that haven't had a chance. Penny, I even remember. Um, yes, ma'am. You haven't spoken. Thank you. My name is Pam Bettis. And I just wanted to make a quick point. The rails to trails, the, the Peavine Trail is a rails to trails trail. That's really unique and special. And most rails to trails trails don't have the spectacular scenery and the beauty that the Peavine Trail does. And what's unique about it is so many people can use it. Even a wheelchair can go down it. I mean, people can use it, whereas that new trail that was built, and I spent a day out there helping, the new trail is much more difficult to navigate for children, for pets, for for bicycles, you know, for regular gravel bikes. And the, the pea vine is special, and you really need to preserve it. Thank you. So, so we're getting late, Penny, I won't forget about you. But I think that it's almost 6.30. We got about seven minutes. And I think that cutting it off at 6.30 would be appropriate. So, yes, sir, I know you've been waiting too, but Penny, go ahead because I want. I know you're trying to wrap up. Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to understand what are the next steps. You started, sure. you said in the next week you want to start the annexation. Yeah. I found out about this meeting two days ago. Okay. So uh, I'm going to repeat the question. So the question is, uh, you know, w when is the annexation going to start? What's the general timeline? How does it unfold? And how does the public become aware of the process? So number one reason we're sitting here today is to make you aware of the process so that nobody can say, hey, I was out of town and I missed it. I think it's safe to say that probably for months we're going to be on the front page of the E! News, the Courier, and every other outlet around. It's going to be very difficult to miss a meeting. I would say shame on you if you missed a meeting, right? It wasn't a priority. Um, the next piece of it is goes back to just, just how the rules work. There is no annexation until I apply for an annexation. So, so it's incumbent upon me to um, lay down the first card, start the process from an official perspective, not only as it relates to the state law, but also city code. And then we start wading through it. There's statutory notice requirements for the neighbors. That, that has to do with state law. Um, there'll be a neighborhood meeting with the neighbors. I'm guessing I've already met most of them, but we'll meet them again. Um, there will be multiple public meetings and hearings in these chambers. As, as the annexation winds its way through the process. Planning and zoning, for those that don't understand, will be primary looking, primarily looking at land use. Um, is this an appropriate use of the land? Does it uh, conform to the general plan? Are the zoning designations proper? The council will look at, at a bigger package, if you will, a broader look at things um, that ties into water, trail system, and PNZ will look at that as well. But, but there is a very um, direct and regimented process that we have to go through. And, and as part of that, I'm going to just speculate because there's no way for me to know. I'm going to guess and tell you there's uh, six to eight public meetings that, that I will be either attending and answering folks' questions from kind of both sides of the aisle, if you will. Um, and my best guess is that it may be beneficial to have another open house. Obviously, this venue is a little small. 
We, I wasn't expecting this large of a turnout. Um, but th the meeting was called to me be, by me because of what I was hearing in the community. And I thought that it's just time to sit down and start talking so that people aren't scared of it. They start to understand it and they can engage in it. Did I answer your question? Oh, okay. So, so the last, the, the last Prop 400 annexation that, that, that I was involved in took me almost three years. Um, there is no way for me, I'll answer it this way. I would venture to guess that the quickest this thing could be voted on would be six months. And it just rolls out from there. I'm going to go over to this gentleman because he's been waiting. I'll come back to you, ma'am. Sure. Yeah, no. So, so when, when we talk about the resort, the first thing that happens is people think of the JW Marriott on the 101, right? right? That is not what it's going to be. So the, the concept, and, and, it, and it is only a concept, there is no conceptual drawing of a resort at the present time, would be something uh, along the lines of maybe the boulders in Carefree, if you've ever been there where it's casitas that are basically tucked into little pockets, dark skies. I've never been there, so I can't help you. Yeah, so, so let me give you another uh, answer. Uh, 80 to 100 rooms at the max. Um, so it, it's, not, it's not a large scale type development. Yes, sir. No golf course. No. No, dark skies. I'm going to go right here because she's been waiting. Yes. As a good neighbor gesture, um, would you be willing to commit to having the next uh, meeting like this at, in a forum where all of those hundreds of people who are outside and out there yeah. uh, could come in and be a part of the conversation? I, I think that's very fair. So the question is, can we get everybody included? Yeah, and and. Sure, I have no problem with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to. I just wanted to say real quick. Like, uh, my name's Pat. Uh, Thank you. I'm a little nervous, but like on on the behalf of water, like because there seems to be this like illusion that like we can own water, you know, like humans can own water, but like water owns us, you know, because there's a, a limited amount of it, and we need it. Water doesn't need us, you know. So I guess what I'm saying is if we keep building, this is like just, if we keep building and developing, there's not enough in the desert to go around eventually, whether it's, you know, your son, your daughter, your granddaughters, you know, whatever. So I just want to say that, that I don't know what to do, but I know that like developing more is, is not that way. You know? so Thank you. Right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
during the day, and you know, most of us were, are working, uh, they're students, and we can't attend them and make our voice heard. This is really gracious and awesome to have it in the evening time. We can do it again. Thank you. Also, could you create some maps that have reference points that are more visible, and maybe one map is done graphically as opposed to just overlaying the aerials? From here, that's very hard to read. I don't understand the graphically question. Uh, like in 3D, are you saying? No, no, not 3D. Oh. Oh, the prominent landmarks is what you're asking for. Sure. Yeah, that, 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 that's easy. Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm going with the last question right here. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi, my name's Michelle McFadden. I grew up in Arizona, and um, I've always used the Dells. When I was a child, we used to come up and swim at Granite Dells, and that was delightful. When I moved to Prescott, up from the valley, um, I started riding my bike there, and uh, rode for years and hoped to get back to it. Right now I have knee issues, and somebody pointed out that the Dells are the Peavine is one of the trails that we can actually walk when we get older. Uh, Prescott's beautiful, but everything's kind of up and down. Um, I just kind of wanted to put things in perspective a little bit, because what we're talking about here, and I, I understand that you started the, the program about values, and I know that you mean values as far as money is concerned. But I want to talk about the other values, and the values are what it means to us. And I think those are more lasting values. But what we're looking at here is 150 homes, apparently, near Point of Rocks. Um, there's 450 people here today. That's more than will probably live in those houses. Um, and so what we're saying is we're going to trade this natural beauty that we have and that many of us use, many of us have used them since we were children, um, and we're going to trade that for 150 houses, which is probably going to be about, I don't know, 350 people because it's probably going to be older people living there that can afford them. So that's about 350 people that are having this beautiful place to live. And to trade that for everything that all of us love just doesn't seem like a very good trade value-wise. Thank you. All right, with that, um, thank you all for attending tonight. Um, we'll certainly be out there. Uh-oh. Excuse me, I just want to thank the uh, city council members that did not have to be here and did not have to speak or be a part of it. They're here and they're listening, and thank you. 
we'll take all of your comments into consideration as we move forward. And uh, like I've said multiple times, we'll certainly be meeting again. Have a good evening.